tonight I have a presentation entitled The Blood of the Covenant, <clears throat> which is focusing in on Hebrews chapters 8 and, and chapters 9 tonight. Um, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 8 begins with the idea that he says the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest that he's been talking about in you know, he hinted a little bit in Hebrews 2, hinted a little bit in Hebrews 4, introduced it in Hebrews 5, backed away from it to preach it to people a little bit, and then came back full bore on the high priesthood of the order of Melchizedek in chapter 7. So as he kind of finishes that up, the main point in what's been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary, and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. This is where the, the writer begins to introduce the idea of what he calls the true tabernacle. And once again, the, the Old Testament temple, the Old Testament tabernacle, had the same floor plan. And so whatever foreshadows uh, there are in the Old Testament, they're the same whether it's the temple or the tabernacle. So he's, he's speaking in terms of a tabernacle here and in, in using the terminology of a tent, uh, the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. <clears throat> now, he also emphasizes Jesus' role as a minister in that tabernacle. See, now, he's really making the point, we, what, what a high priest we have. All those Old Testament priests, um, they kept dying. We have a priest who lives forever. We have a priest who is at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Um, every Christian should really process that and begin to think in terms of how blessed we are in terms of our ability to approach the Father and to spend time in prayer. So what will he offer? That's, uh, that's the question here. Now, every, every high priest in the Old Testament, every physical high priest, is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So, Exodus through Deuteronomy give all kinds of details on all these offerings, but they do have a particular focus on the Day of Atonement, a lot of details of which are given in Leviticus 16. And that's where the writer of Hebrews is really going to zero in on, is the offerings on the Day of Atonement. So, those physical high priests had to offer both gifts and sacrifices. It's necessary that this high priest, that Jesus, also have something to offer, what will it be that he would offer? So the hybrid, actually the writer of Hebrews is going to just leave us dangling there for a while. Okay? He does that. You know, he hits a point, and then he lets it dangle and works on something, and then he comes back and picks it up. So, uh, so dangle with me, audience, here until, uh, until we get back to that point. Now the location of this tabernacle, location of this tent which the Lord pitched and not man. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 8, 4, he says, If he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. You know, again, we've talked about how the Old Testament priest had to be the descendants of Aaron, of the tribe of Levi. So sometimes it's called a Levitical priesthood, uh, because Moses was a priest, but he wasn't a uh, descendant from Aaron. Um, it's generally the priest or of the order of Aaron. Jesus according to the flesh, is a descendant of David, the tribe of Judah. So he could not minister as a priest at all on earth, okay? Those who offer sacrifices and gifts on the earth offer them in accordance with the law, okay? So since Jesus cannot be a priest on earth, then the only place his priesthood can be is in heaven. And so the writer of Hebrews is really, again, trying to bring the Hebrew Christians uh, up, up uh, to speed on this, he's trying to get him to focus off the things of the earth and, and focus on things of heaven. Now, those Old Testament priests, of them it was written, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. This is one of the ways that we know that the typology is there between the Old Testament tabernacle and the true tabernacle. He uses words like this, copy, going to use shadow, he's going to use type here in a minute. But these all let us know that the physical ones are a physical representation of what is actually in heaven. In other words, God's using the physical so that we have something to get our hands on. Therefore, we can process the spiritual based on the physical. 
So that, that tabernacle is located in heaven. So he said uh, those things serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to wreck the tabernacle. So the real things in heaven, the physical things were going to be on earth. And the physical things are the copy. And so God actually warned Moses when he was about to put up that tabernacle. He said, uh, and these instructions were given to Moses by God himself. He said, see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Every detail was important. You know, whether it was the laver out front, whether it was the big altar, the bronze altar out front, whether it was the altar of incense or the table of showbread or the lampstand, um, the, uh, the back room, everything was, was a foreshadow. And he, God says, you make it exactly according to that pattern that I showed you on the mountain. So where it says pattern there in the New American Standard, that's the word tupos, which it generally means a type or a foreshadow. And so the, overall, the, the, the tabernacle serves as a type, and the, the true church, the, the, the true temple of God, serves as the anti-type. Now, you need to hold that thought because I'm going to throw a wrinkle at you here down the road. But that's generally how types and anti-types work. So in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6 then, it says he has a more excellent ministry. See, by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted upon better promises. Okay, More excellent ministry, better covenant, better promises. Okay, So why would you be hanging on uh, to the old one? Okay. So that's a sweeping panorama, if you think about it, from the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek here to the true tabernacle to the better covenant. See, the writer of Hebrews is just bringing these things on step by step by step and making some of these great sweeping statements that he kind of comes back and works in more details as we go. So better promises, he said. In Galatians chapter 3 and uh, verse 16, it says the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Okay, so he's going to, Paul here in Galatians 3 is going to explain what that means. He does not say and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. So those better promises then are detailed back there in, in Genesis. I'm going to bring a couple of them uh, forward for you. One of them was the blessing. You know, the writer of Hebrews already referred to the blessing, where he said, blessing, I will bless you, multiplying, I will multiply you. Uh, in Genesis uh, 22:18, he says, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, initially that looks like Abraham, but it looks well beyond Abraham. When uh, another one was the covenant. See, in Genesis chapter 15, it says, in verse 18, it says, on that day, a Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I've given this land from the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the great river Euphrates, the land of the Girgashite, the Hittite, Jebusite, all those ites, okay? But when you look at that covenant that he made in Genesis 15, remember, he had Abraham cut animals in half and, uh, you know, laid the larger animal half on one side, half the other, had some birds there um, for, for part of the, the covenant making, uh, dead birds. Of course, he's there getting, keeping the live birds away. But about uh, sundown, a, a terror and a thick darkness fell upon Abraham, and there was a a uh, smoking oven and a flaming torch that went through between the pieces together. See, Abraham was thinking he was going to get to walk between the pieces where God would actually take a physical form like he had been doing. Uh, but he doesn't get to do that. He just gets to watch uh, the, f the smoking oven, the flaming torch. Well, that's the father and the son going through those pieces. See, the covenant was with Abraham's seed. See, Christ. So the blessing, the, the, the covenant... All these promises that were back there in Genesis were really with Abraham's seed, that is Christ. So that's why this new covenant we're introducing here is going to be based on better promises. Um, you know, and all of these predate Moses. If uh, the Jew was to go back and, and, and challenge God a little bit, say, well, you know, we've had this covenant for 1,500 years. Uh, we've had these sacrifices for 1,500 years. We've had this priesthood for 1,500 years. 
and uh, you're changing the deal. And God says, going to say, well, uh, let's back up another 550 years here and let's take a look at Genesis. Your own law is going to tell you what, what I put in motion long before we did it with Moses. So as he begins to introduce the, uh, what he's going to call the new covenant, he talks about the first covenant. In, in this case, this is the one that has to do with Moses. In other words, the, the covenant of Christ, and the foundation for it was laid, say in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, but doesn't really take effect yet. The, the basis is there, but the covenant's not really in effect. So he's going to call the, the covenant that came through Moses, he's going to call that the first covenant. So he, he says if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. Okay. Now, the writer of Hebrews, see, remember, he's got to convince his Hebrew Christian audience here of the superiority of the Christian system. Remember, as we look back on it, um, Hebrews chapters 1 and 2, superiority of Christ over the angels because the old law was given through the agency of angels, so that which comes through Christ is therefore superior to that which came through angels. Uh, the <clears throat> children of Israel came out of Egypt, captured the promised land, uh, instituted the covenant there. Um, Jesus is superior to the combination of Moses and Joshua. So once again, that which comes through Jesus. Uh, then as he started to work on the high priest, see the high priesthood of Christ is superior to the high priesthood according to the Aaron. Now he's going to talk about the covenant. So if he said the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. Uh, what do you mean second? Okay, well, in other words, the audience say, okay, I'd like to know, have you have some scripture proof here that there is going to be a second covenant before you start talking about it. Uh, writer Hebrews says, all right, we can do that. In Hebrews 8.8, 8, which is quotation from Jeremiah 31.31, 31, 31, uh, he says, finding fault with them, he says, behold, Days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See, he says, I'm going to put a new covenant in effect. See, so there is going to be a second covenant that is sought. But it's going to be a different kind of covenant. As he goes on to say in the quote there, he says, It will not be like the covenant which I made my, with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. See, remember he said, I find fault with them. So... Uh, I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And what was the problem? They did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. The problem wasn't the covenant. The problem was the people. So God's going to set in motion where the laws then are actually going to be set in the heart and in, in the mind rather than on stone. Now, as we look at this prophecy, you've got to remember that the house of Israel is a prophetic reference to the Gentiles who had become Israel. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. By the time Jeremiah wrote those, those words, the physical nation in Israel had been gone for 100 years. So uh, there's always a set of prophecies of an of a Israel that's coming back. A little bit of work you can show that that's a prophetic reference to the Gentiles who become Christians. The house of Judah, then, is a prophetic reference to the Jewish core who had become Christians. So, as he kind of goes on there in Hebrews 8.10, he says, For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. Implicit house of Judah gets included in this. <clears throat> this is the covenant I will make a house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their, their minds. I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The, the, the system of law, the law of Moses, tries to work from the outside in. And that's why it's, it's described as having a ministry of death. Um, once the inside of man is corrupted, that's why he said finding fault with them. Once the inside is corrupted, there's nothing on the outside is, is able to change man. There's no uh, amount of uh, reprogramming the mind, no amount of self-help books, uh, no amount of turning over the new leaf that can actually touch that corrupted inner man. And so what God's done is he's, he's put in motion a system here where this time he says, instead of writing the laws on stone, I'm going to write them on their hearts and in their minds. So they're going to be, a, in other words, they're going to be a people who have a pure inside and who will actually want to do the things that, that I want them to do. And then he says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Kind of like he said back there in Hosea. So when it comes to knowing the Lord then, back in the Old Testament, 
when uh, Joshua captured the promised land, the, uh, the Levites um, didn't get any particular prophecy. Judah had an area, Simeon was inside Judah, there was Benjamin, you had Ephraim, you had Reuben and Gad and half of Manasseh east of the Jordan, you had Issachar and, and Asher and, and Zebulun, you know, all of Dan, every one of them had their, their set of property. The Levites didn't get any. See, they were scattered uh, throughout. And the, the purpose was that they were to teach the people. They were to teach the people the law, to teach the people the, the words of the book, so that the people might know the Lord. And you'll, if you follow that through, you'll see that expression uh, in the Old Testament. Now, the, the Levites didn't do very well at it, and probably it's because the people weren't, you know, they're too busy to listen, okay? Um, as you recall, when we were talking about tithing, the, every year in the fall, when the car, crops were harvested, 10% of those crops were to go to the Levites. And then the Levites were to take 10% of that and send it to the temple. But the reason the Levites were to get a tithe was so that they could engage in the function of teaching. Well, what happens if the people don't tithe? Well, then, then the Levites got to go totally to farming. And if they go to totally to farming, you know, if you're milking cows in the morning, you're milking cows in the evening, you're, you know, selling your seed, you're weeding your crops, you're, okay, how much time is left for teaching? There isn't any. So they didn't do a very good job, but that's what they were supposed to do, is to teach the people. So uh, when we come under the new covenant then, it's a superior system. He, he says, and they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest. And you're not going to have to go through inside the church anymore and, and try to teach the people to know the Lord. Because you must know the Lord to come under the terms of the new covenant. He says, I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. See, not have to be taught, because when you're forgiven, you, you're, you're that, you come to a position where you know the Lord. The way the apostle Paul put it, now you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God. When, when you're forgiven, when the barrier's down, uh, you can know God. So uh, that's why the, the new covenant's going to be superior. Uh, that basis is already taken care of. We're going to build from here then. So, the significance then of the new covenant. One of the sig things that's significant about the new covenant is it made the old obsolete. Uh, he said, uh, when he said a new covenant, you know, he just flat says he made the old obsolete. Uh, when you finish with one and you start another, uh, that's the way it works. Or, if, another way to put it, when you start one, you finish the other. So, the new covenant puts an end to the old covenant. Now, that, go along with that is the end of the physical temple. Uh, he says, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Now, the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem was actually prophesied in the Old Testament. It was repeatedly prophesied by Jesus. So, as he's hitting here these Hebrew Christians, he's reminding them uh, of those prophecies in a very simple form, it's ready to disappear. So what's going to happen then is the type is going to be replaced by the anti-type. The shadow is going to be replaced by the substance. So that gets us to the Old, Tabern Old Testament tabernacle and its design. Now he said, in Hebrews 9.1, even the first covenant had regulations of divine, and I put service there, the New American Standard puts worship, um, you know, they just flat messed up on it. Um, it. It's service and the earthly sanctuary. Now, worship, you know, the, the direct thrust, there, there's a word, sabalmai, which is sometimes translated worship, but it just simply means reverence. You know, it's not really talking about what we call worship. Uh, when Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the precepts of men's, in vain do they reverence me. And that would be the same word that would use for the God-fearing Gentiles. Okay. So the, the direct word for worship is a Greek word, proskuneo. Okay. And in the, under the terms of the Mosaic Covenant, proskuneo is what the people did. The people came to, temp, the, to the temple to engage in worship. Now, service is the Greek word latruo. Uh, that's, by the way, where the word liturgy comes from. And, uh, but the latruo, that's the service. That's what the priests did. 
And so what we're looking at here in, in Hebrews chapter 9 is we're looking at service. Um, people get confused about it. Um, you know, when I became a Christian, I, I became a Christian by watching the old Jewel Miller um, patriarchal age, mosaic age, Christian age uh, film strips, which we have on, on video now. And, but right away, see, they start talking about the sacrifices that, that Cain and Abel offered. And, uh, you know, Cain, Cain's offering was rejected, and Abel's offering was accepted by God, and, and they make the point. See, Abel's worship was accepted, Cain's worship was not accepted. See, they, they, they get the two confused all the way through here, and that's kind of a problem that's come into the English language by tradition. It's like if you look up the word baptism in a dictionary, it's going to tell you sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. Well, the fact that the modern language confuses it doesn't mean it's so. So sometimes you have to go back and, and look at the roots. Uh, you know, I took some time to look at uh, Zodiac's uh, stuff on, uh, on worship and service. It's really interesting. You know, he always says the word is service, and then when he's commenting on it, he substitutes the wor worship sometimes. But he always calls it service. And I, I just find that really interesting how certain things aren't connected there. So the first covenant had its regulation for divine service. In other words, see, the, the regulations are part of the law, actually part of the covenant. I, I have a picture here of the, the Old Testament tabernacle. This is taken from uh, Rose Publishing's, uh, one of their books on the, the things about the Old Covenant, particularly the temple and the tabernacle. And... Uh, that's why it has a uh, ring binder right down the middle of it, in case you're wondering. Um, but, you know, it looks pretty good, actually. So you see there the uh, bronze uh, altar uh, on the left, uh, lower left there. You see the, the laver there uh, for the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, the, uh, the laver was actually betwe directly between the altar and then the, the tent back there, uh, which would be the tabernacle proper. When uh, Solomon built the temple, then the, the labor was off to the side a little bit. It brings, and then so this, uh, <coughs> the tabernacle then was divided into two rooms, the outer room and, and the inner room. So the outer room is called the outer tabernacle, right? And Hebrews says in Hebrews 9.2, for there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were a lampstand, you know, the table, and the sacred bread. Okay, now that's where the white writer Hebrews stops on that. And he said, this is called the holy place. See, it's contrast the holy of holies, uh, which is going to be the back room. And here's a picture of the, the outer room here, the outer tabernacle. Uh, we've got some barefooted priests there. You'll see on the right-hand side, you'll see the table of showbread uh, with the, the priest happily putting the unleavened loaves there. Uh, on the, the left side, you'll see a, another barefooted priest happily making sure the, the lamps of the lampstand are, are lit. And then against the back wall, you'll see the altar of incense. Now, that's how it's normally described, but the writer of Hebrews is going to describe that as being in the back room. So he, it looks like on the Day of Atonement, which the writer of Hebrews is particularly focusing in on, move that uh, altar of incense so that the smoke... Uh, from the altar of incense was actually covering the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the back there. So the writer of Hebrews goes on to talk there in Hebrews 9, 3, and 4 in the Holy of Holies. He said, now behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies. It says it has a, the golden altar of incense. See, there's, that's what got moved, you know, back there where it's kind of behind her curtain. Uh, and he says the Ark of the Covenant uh, covered on all sides with gold. In, in the Ark of the Covenant, uh, he describes as three things. There was a golden jar holding the manna uh, that never spoiled. There was Aaron's rod, which budded, and in the tables of the covenant, which would have been the actual uh, stone set of Ten Commandments. And here's a, a picture of the Ark of the Covenant, artist rendition there. Um, you can see the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim on top, and then kind of schematically he just has the pot of manna, Aaron's rod, which budded, and the, the stone tablets. He kind of has them pulled out, but they were actually deposited. Uh, there's some way to deposit things in the Ark of the Covenant, and that's where those were for, for a period of time. 
As the writer of Hebrews goes on, he says, uh, above then the, the mercy seat, above, above on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, were the cherubim of glory, those winged critters, overshadowing the mercy seat. And when God gave Moses the instructions for building the, the mercy seat and describing the, the cherubim, he said, there, between the wings of the cherubim, there I will meet with you, and there I will speak with you. The writer of Hebrews says, but of these things we cannot now speak in detail. The reason is that the, the Ark of the Covenant had been missing since the Babylonian destruction of the Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Um, again, Ezekiel, in his vision, he saw the glory of the Lord move from the back room to the threshold, the temple. Then he saw the glory of the Lord move uh, to the edge of, of, of town. Then he saw the glory of the Lord move to the mountains east of town. And then he saw the glory of the Lord move uh, and be gone. And so Ichabod, no, no glory was written over that temple. So, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant was never found. See, the glory, in other words, the glory of the Lord never came back. So that's why the writer of Hebrews says we can't, we can't speak of these things in detail. Now, he starts talking about the Day of Atonement. He says, when these things have been so prepared in Hebrews 9, 6, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle performing the divine service. So on a daily basis, the priests are there. They're, they're doing the incense offering if they need to officiate at the table of showbread, uh, anything connected with the lampstand. Uh, they have to handle that. But, he says, into the second, that'd be the back room, the Holy of Holies, only the high priest enters once a year, and he says, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. See, in Leviticus 16, where, as I say, gives most of the details on this, first he had to offer the blood of a bull for himself and for his family in order to purify himself so that then he was fit to make an intercessory offering on behalf of the people. And so then he'd kill the, the, a goat and he'd bring the blood of the goat in. Uh, so uh, we got the blood of bulls and goats or the blood of calves and goats here involved in the Day of Atonement. Now, once again, before the priest can even begin to intercede for the people, he has to have himself purified. And that's a detail that you want to keep lodged in the back of your mind. Also, it's important in understanding a comment that the writer of Hebrews is going to make here in a little bit. So, notice also that these sins that uh, the high priest is interceding for are the sins committed by the people in ignorance. See, in other words, a person, you know, um, deliberately plans on uh, running a cruddy business deal or he's planning on uh, stealing some property. Somebody's uh, planning on an affair outside of wedlock. All the things that people get into, those are not sins committed in ignorance. Sins committed in ignorance are if you walk uh, over the top of a dead body and don't realize it. Uh, say a lizard ran across one of your uh, eating uh, dishes and you didn't know it. That, that's unclean, but you didn't know it. See, that's a sin, sin committed in ignorance. Now, under the New Covenant, there are no sins committed in ignorance. Every sin is a sin of choice. But you can see how in the Old Covenant, you could commit one of those sins because you wouldn't know. You know how would you know that the lizard ran across it while you weren't looking? See, those, those sort of things. So that's what the, the Day of Atonement was for, was to roll those sins back. So, pretty clearly uh, a foreshadow here. Hebrews 9, 8, and 9, he says, Now the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol, parable, for the present time. In other words, the, the Old Testament tabernacle, or the Old Testament temple, in the case of what was standing in Jerusalem, once that, all, as long as that was in operation then the way into the true tabernacle was not made known. See, that's why when Jesus died on the cross and there was this massive earthquake, one of the things that happened was that the veil in the temple in Jerusalem tore in two from top to bottom. That was God's signal that he was done with the physical temple. 
Okay, so that ceased to operate. I mean, the priests still kept bringing their offerings. They kept going through the rituals. They kept going through the motions. But as far as God's concerned, you know, the grain offering had ceased. Everything was done because the fact that the, the true offering, the perfect offering, the complete offering had just, been, had just been offered. So why would you need the physical anymore? So he's using the terminology that the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing which he said it's a symbol for the present time. Now, that's once again letting you know that the physical one was a symbol or a foreshadow, preparatory instruction for the information about the true temple of God. So Hebrews 9, 9 and 10, he says, Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper. Now, here's where that piece of information I gave you comes in important. Literally, it's the one who performed the service. I say they're offered which can, cannot make the one who performed the service. In other words, the priest cannot make the priest perfect in conscience since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Now, if they can't make the priest perfect in conscience and the priest is the one interceding for the people, the people are even less able to have their consciences cleansed under the old system. So there are regulations to the body, physical things to teach spiritual truths imposed until what he calls a time of, of reformation. Basically a time of reformation means bringing in that what should have been there all along. That's, that's what that whole thrust is, is all about there. So we get to the real deal. In Hebrews 9.11 then it says when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come. They're called the good things to come because they were foreshadowed and prophesied in the Old Testament, operative uh, from you know, human perspective from the day of Pentecost onward. Okay. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. See, in other words, uh, but you couldn't process this without the physical one. Without a picture of the high priest going into the back room of the physical temple or physical tabernacle, you can't process that. But with that picture, then we got an idea. Okay, Christ um, enters into a spiritual temple. Uh, it's not made with hands. There's nothing physical there. It's not of this creation. And so Hebrews 9.12, and it says it wasn't through the blood of those goats and calves, see, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, the blood that Jesus has taken into the true holy place is not going to be physical blood. When he ascends on the 40th day for, uh, following his resurrection, he's not reaching back with a big paw and trying to <clears throat> scrape up some of the dust of the ground, uh, blood cake dust, you know, 43 days later after his crucifixion. Uh, see, that's, that's not what's going on here. The cross is a transition from the physical to the spiritual. So Jesus physically sheds his blood on the cross as a sacrifice. But as a high priest, it's going to be spiritual blood offered in a spiritual tabernacle for a spiritual people. <clears throat> so it wasn't through the blood of goats and calves then, which you can see how minor that would be, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Some of the brethren struggle sometimes with the idea that it's that spiritual blood. Um, because they kind of have the contact uh, idea that when you get immersed into Christ, you go back and you contact the physical blood shed on the cross, and that the physical blood shed on the cross is what forgives your sin. Now, there's an element of that because that's part of the package, but, you know, the, one of the key points is, is that the, the sacrifice has no value unless you have the priest to offer the, the sacrifice. The animal killed in the altar brazen altar out on the front of the tabernacle, if that blood just stayed out there at that altar, it wouldn't have any effectiveness at all. It takes a high priest to take that blood in and offer that blood in the proper place. The same way the blood of Jesus. Jesus dies on the cross, and then there's no priest to do anything with that blood. That, that's just worthless. So Jesus has to be his own high priest here, and he's got to enter the true holy place, because he can't be a priest on earth. So he's got to enter the true holy place, 
But since it's not of this creation, not made with hands, nothing physical there, the blood that he's taken is not going to be physical blood. It's spiritual blood. But because it's spiritual blood, and he does it once for all, then he obtains for us eternal redemption. Okay. Now, there's tremendous cleansing ability in this spiritual blood. In Hebrews 9.13, he says, Now if the blood of goats and bulls, and in the ashes of a heifer sprinkling, which has to do with the purification rituals, uh, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling, those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. Okay, as far as the old covenant was concerned, if you did these things, there was a, there was a, a cleansing of the flesh. There was a make it possible for you to be in fellowship with Israel, for example. When Jesus came down from the ser Sermon on the Mount, there was a leper at the base of the hill. And the leper said to, to Jesus, he said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out and he touched him. And the leper was cleansed. And Jesus said, see that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded. See, so uh, that guy, even though Jesus cleansed him from the leprosy, he had to go to the priest and he had to be ritually cleansed in order to be welcomed back into Jewish society. It's a cleansing of the flesh there, okay? A leper was unclean and uh, therefore he couldn't associate in Jewish society. So if those things were able to cleanse the flesh, that is a purification process so that you could go back into Jewish society, he says, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You know, it's significant that God always said, I don't want any blemished animals uh, for a sacrifice. Uh, I can't bring some scab-eyed cow. You can't see one three-legged bull. You know, when they were trying to do that in the book of Malachi, you know, Malachi the prophet says, would you offer it to the governor? Okay, would he be pleased with you? Okay. When you offer things to the Lord, you're offering the best. So Christ then is offered without blemish to God, but it's in the spiritual realm. Through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God. So what will the blood of Christ do? You cleanse your conscience. There is no other agency or agent on this earth that will cleanse a person's conscience other than the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, regardless of how much people claim this or how much they might claim that, the fact is the scripture teaches clearly that the blood of Jesus is the only thing that's going to cleanse a person's conscience. But what a blessing that is. Uh, every, nobody in the Old Testament had clean consciences. You know, the best of them, Noah, blameless in, in his day. Um, David, that's what he's crying out for is a clean conscience. Uh, Nobody in the Old Testament, John the Immerser, didn't have a clean conscience. It's only those who've come under the, the blood covenant of Jesus Christ that have a clean conscience. Now, that blood, though, is powerful. In Hebrews 9.15, talks about how Jesus is going to be the mediator, then, of a new covenant. Now, the thrust of the idea of mediator here is not kind of a go-between between two parties. That's how we normally think of a mediator. Here, Jesus, first of all, he's the testator, as we're going to see in a second. He's going to, it's, it's his will that's going to have to have somebody to execute that will. And so he's kind of his own go-between. So that's what mediator means, is the one who, who executes the will. It says, for this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant, so that since the death has taken place, catch these words, for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. The way Paul put it, God passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time. He might be both just and justifier, the one who has the faith of Christ. It makes sense. You know, if Abraham had lived in our time, he'd be a Christian. David lived in our time, he'd be a Christian. See, so God is going to have the blood of Jesus retroactively applied backwards uh, to those guys. And um, you say, well, how can that, you know, how can you apply things retroactive? Well, okay, remember the, 
the Old Testament tabernacle is a shadow. Now, to produce a shadow, you have to have substance. And so, uh, a shadow then, the reason that the shadow exists in the Old Testament is the light is shining backwards. It's, it's retroactively shining backwards in order to produce the shadow. Now, we just got well above all of our pay grades right there um, as to how that works, but that's how it works. So God retroactively forgave these guys because of Jesus' death and because of the offering that took place in the spiritual holy of holies. In Hebrews 9.16 then, as we, well, comment here I've got to make before that. So you can see to be under the new covenant, you know, we talked about that in Hebrews uh, chapter 8 there, their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. To be under the new covenant, a person has to be forgiven. Now the Old Testament foreshadow painted a picture so that we can understand how Jesus, high priest of the order of Melchizedek, entered the true holy place. See, again, the writer of Hebrews is laying these things down for us. And it says, in the true holy place, he offered his blood and his blood of the covenant to purchase forgiveness and clean consciences for his disciples. See, he's making these connections for us to get to his point then. So in Hebrews 9.16 then, it says, now where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. Again, that's very parallel to a will. Uh, as long as a person's alive, the will or the testament of the individual doesn't, is not in effect. Uh, but once he dies, then, then the, the will takes effect. In this case, he's talking about the covenant that Jesus made. As long as Jesus is alive, the old covenant, old testament, old will is still in effect. Um, in Hebrews 9.17, he says, For covenants valid only when men are dead, never enforced while the one who made it lives. Okay, that makes sense. So, Jesus has got to die in order for the new covenant, the better covenant, to take effect. So, Hebrews 9.18, he says, Now, therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. In other words, God built some types, some foreshadows into that old covenant. One of the key ones had to do with, with blood. He says, For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with the water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. So he's taken that blood of the covenant and he sprinkled it, everything getting sprinkled with that blood to sanctify. Even the people are being sanctified, Levites are being sanctified. <coughs> Now, this is what Moses said. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. See? So, not even the old covenant was inaugurated without blood. There had to be blood shed, blood sprinkled, in order for the old covenant to take effect. That means that there's going to have to be blood shed and blood sprinkled in order for the new covenant to take effect. Uh, guess whose blood that might be. So, Hebrews 9.21, then, he makes the point. He said, look it. In the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. Powerful, important. And according to law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Powerful, powerful statement. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So, the, the shed blood... And then the sprinkled blood resulting from the shed blood are what are going to be necessary for an individual to have forgiveness under the terms of the new covenant. Now, the, if you look at Acts chapter 10, or excuse me, Acts chapter uh, uh, 19, uh, 19, Acts chapter 20, okay, sorry. Acts chapter 20. And uh, verse 28, the Apostle Paul said to the elders at Ephesus, he said, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. See, Jesus purchased the church with his blood. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. He says, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says, Or do you not know that your body 
is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. He said, you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So he's really making the point then that it was the blood of Jesus that bought us. Now that's a, that's a high price. So without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Um, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, there's a lot of references uh, to this blood. And again, throughout the New Testament, it's not only the shed blood, but it's the sprinkled blood uh, where it, it becomes effective. Okay. In um, Ephesians 1, 7, it says, that In him we have redemption through his blood. See, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. In uh, Colossians chapter 1, In uh, verse 19, Colossians 1, 19, it says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. It didn't say by the blood, it said through the blood. It was, you know, the, the blood had to be shed on the cross to get to the blood sprinkled in glory. But what a powerful statement. Everything is reconciled to God through that blood. Uh, even heaven itself had to be reconciled to God. You know, we, as you recall, Satan and his angels sinned in heaven. And so the very first act that Jesus performed when he ascended was to, to make purification of sins. That is, he, he cleansed heaven. So the events on earth have a heavenly impact. Powerful statement. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So in Hebrews 9.23, back to the slide presentation here. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of things in heavens to be cleansed with these. But the heavenly things themselves are better sacrifices than these. See, the copies, again, were the things of the Mosaic Law, the tabernacle, temple. They're the copies. And they're cleansed with earthly sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. I mean, in one sense, there's only one, but everything connected with Christ, whether it's scourging, by his scourge stripes, or we are healed, all that thing, all that feeds into what he's going to call the better sacrifices here. Now, again, the better sacrifices are not just what happened on earth. It also includes the things that happened in heaven. Christ, as he puts it here in Hebrews 9.24, Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy, here he's going to use the word anti-type, I'll explain that in a minute, of the true one, but now into heaven, into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. See, you know, when talking about the better sacrifices, he takes it all the way into heaven itself. Okay? And then he uses the word anti-type to refer to the copy. Now, again, I did some digging on that just to make sure I knew what I was talking about. Basically, because he's already referred to, sometimes the word anti-type, it means what I referred back to. So, so since he's already talked about the, the, the copies, then the next thing referred to is going to be the, uh, uh, the anti-type of the true one. Okay, So sometimes those words get switched around, flopped around, just because of the order of context. But generally, anti-type is the real thing. The, the type is the foreshadow. We just got flopped around here because of the order in which he's communicating. <clears throat> so that's why the translators, you know, do a good job. A mere copy of the true one. Christ entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. <clears throat> nor, in Hebrews 9.25, nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood is not his own. One of the questions I often get is, I think, well, back there when Mary Magdalene uh, said to Jesus, you know, the King James Version kind of kind of throws you a little bit. Uh, Jesus there says, don't touch me. You know, um, what he literally said is stop clinging to me. I've not yet ascended to my father. Um, some people draw the conclusion as soon as Jesus left Mary, then he ascended. You know, because he said, I've not yet ascended. Jesus is only going to send once. That word once keeps showing up. He didn't ascend multiple times. He ascended once. Um, and uh, so he's not going to offer himself often as a high priest. He's going to offer himself once. He's going to ascend once. 
And that's it. It is one action. So he died on the cross. Um, he was buried. He was raised again on the third day. He appeared over a period of 40 days. And let's see, that should be coming up, what? Uh, that would be next Thursday, right? Next Thursday would be the Ascension Day. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he ascended, and uh, at his ascension, then that's when he appeared. Uh, uh, that's when he ascended. It's the only time he ascended. Hebrews 9.26 Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once, see, again, stressing once, at the consummation of the ages, the apex of all history, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Um, the, the Greek word there is suntelion, for some of you that like to dig into that a little bit. It's often translated end of the ages. And again, that can kind of throw you because you're thinking, okay, well, end in time. Uh, Suntelian can mean end in terms of time, but Suntelian is, is like the English word end. Uh, end can be time or it can be purpose. The old uh, communist statement, the end justifies the means, is a good example of that. The, the, the end is the purpose. So the consummation of the ages is a good translation here, lets you know that the end in terms of purpose, the high point, of the ages is when Jesus ascended and offered his blood, spiritual blood, in the true holy place, heaven itself. Okay, that was the high point of all the ages. Okay. Now, back in the Day of Atonement, you know, when the when the high priest is there and you know he you know the people are standing there and you know there's two goats and they draw lots for the goats and one goat's going to be sacrificed and so that, that's set aside, and the other goat is pushed off to the side because it's going to be the, the, the scapegoat. <clears throat> and so then the people watch the priest take the blood, the bull, kill the blood, the bull, catch the blood, take the blood into the back room, come out, and watch the people watch the high priest kill the goat, <clears throat> take the blood of the goat in the back room, sprinkle it on behalf of people. <clears throat> now the high point here is going to be when the, when the pre, as far as the people are concerned, is when the priest comes back out. That's what the, what's visible to them, okay? So we've got a parallel thing here uh, for the people. Hebrews 9.27 says, Inasmuch as it's appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. See, so we're like the people waiting outside the tabernacle now. We're waiting for the reappearance of our high priest as he comes out of the, the tabernacle, in a, in a manner of speaking, to appear to the people. He says he'll appear a second time for salvation. Salvation here has to do with getting your resurrected body. And he's co coming for those who eagerly await him. So we are a special people. If you think about it, Old Testament Israel makes it clear in Hebrews 8.8, 8, God found fault with them. Fault with them, okay? But there's no fault with the New Testament people. As it makes it really clear here, Christ appeared in heaven, appears in heaven for us. See, with Christ appearing for us, there's no fault. There's nothing on the record. As far as the east is from the west, I've separated you from your sins. See, it's, it's awesome what God's done for it. So that's the great intercessory ministry of our high priest and mediator of the covenant. And praise God that he has done these things. Uh, and it's, it's tremendous in the spiritual realm. God's challenge, of course, is getting us to process in the spiritual realm whose we are and who we are and the tremendous blessings we have.